Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Weird Shit. This time I'm going to be talking a little bit about particle systems and uh, some of the stuff you can do with them. And uh, I really like using them for a bunch of different things. And I'm going to get right in by uh, setting up a little particle system for scattering them around. Now before I get started, there's two things I want to mention. I've got these two groups over here. Um, with colored cubes and the other one uh, with just one material on all three cubes. And these are three separate ones, um, just to have a nice indication in the viewport to see exactly what we're doing when we're setting some of this stuff up. So first thing I'm gonna do is actually, I'm gonna create a plane, very simple, scale it up a little bit. And obviously I'm gonna add a particle system to it. So um, first thing I like to do when I'm scattering, is obviously set the start and end to one. That way the particle system uh, exists from the first frame and it doesn't really change. Now, they're still moving around and there's still some um, physics and stuff going on. So I'd like to turn those off and uh, make sure if I play now after 50 frames, they're gonna disappear because I'd like to set my lifetime up really, really high. And this is a very simple and basic setup um, to scatter particles over a mesh. This could be literally any shape, it doesn't really matter. Now, what I'm gonna do is first, I'm going to select down here in the render tab. I'm going to select the color cubes. There we go. And these are the three cubes in the very last layer over here um, that you'll be able to see. And uh, if we look closely, these are these cubes are standing up and yet these ones are sort of lying down. And to fix that very quickly, I like to use the uh, rotation option over here, which I'll enable, which basically tells the particle system to take over the rotation um, from the objects themselves. Now, there's still going to be sort of, and I'm gonna add both layers in here, they're still gonna be oriented in the wrong way. Um, so what we need to do to fix this is rotate them 90 degrees on the Y axis. And as you'll see, now they're all standing up. So I'm just gonna move these over a little bit. There we go. So we can see them and see what we're doing. Now, with that being said, um, there's a couple of things that I like to do. I'm gonna close this velocity tab over here because we turned the physics to none um, and we'll get into the rotation in just a minute. So the first controls that we have to look at are the size controls over here. And obviously, as I increase the size, the size of the particles is going to become larger. Now the random size, um, what it does, it actually makes the particles smaller. Um, and depending on the factor, basically you'll have them go almost down to a zero scale if you set the random size up to one. But it's interesting to note that it doesn't scale the particles up. So you control um, your maximum size over here or if you turn the random size off, just the general size of all the particles. And as you turn the random size up, it will scale them down, um, you know, randomly uh, down to the smallness basically you're setting down here. So again, random size of one, you're probably gonna have a particle that's about, you know, very, very, very small that's gonna um, approach a sort, of, sort of a zero scale. So here we go. Um, obviously we can control the number of particles by just bringing it down here and you see them happening, uh, see them coming up. If you like the number of particles that you have, but you don't really like the scatter of them, you can also change the seed up here um, and just experiment with it. Sometimes if I have a particle set, a system set up the way I like it, but I'm not really into the way they're scattered, I'll just change the seed a little bit and make sure uh, I get something a little bit more desirable. Now, a um, couple more things down here. The first one is the pick random, which ensures that every time a particle is being put down on the plane, it's gonna pick a random one uh, from the group. If you turn on whole group, you can actually scatter the entire particle group itself. Um, and obviously because these are offset from zero, if I were to move these around, you'll see um, them moving around as well. So that's what the, uh, the position, I guess, where are we? Um, because you're grabbing the whole group and these are moved over, it's gonna grab the point of the group down here and it's gonna mess with them. So turning off whole group, I can pick uh, random ones from the group again and I just have singular particles uh, coming up. Now, one last thing uh, that's really cool that you can do with these is if you turn on the use count, you can actually tell which particles, uh, let's say, show up a little bit more in the system, which particles are say dominant particles and which aren't. So let's say I grab this uh, second one, I believe that's the blue one. Yep, it is. Uh, set this count to 10. Then we're gonna have for each uh, 10 blue particles, there's gonna be one red one and one green one. You can adjust this individually. 
So now we have a particle system that mainly has a dominant number of particles in the blue, uh, of the blue ones, then about half of that in the green ones and about 10% of those in the red ones. It doesn't matter how many you add, it will respect that count. And as you can see, you can do some really interesting things with this. So that way you can have um, sort of a, a main particle that's being spread all over your object and then have some other particles with a little bit of um, variation in between. Now, um, some people might already be thinking, oh, this is cool, I can have maybe some particles that light up in between, do something cool with them. Well, there's actually another way of doing this, and uh, I wanted to show you very quickly how I would approach doing that when we're talking about shading. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna turn off use count so I just have all the particles themselves. Um, and as you can see, they're just spread out. We have, say we have 500 particles, and they're all spread out and it's just choosing between them. I'm gonna grab the other group very quickly. And again, we need to fix our rotation. So I'm gonna rotate these 90 degrees on the Y axis. And now they're fixed once again. Um, and what I'd like to do with these is I'd like to actually have some variation within the shading without having to resort to different cubes. So first I'll, uh, I'll show you how to approach this uh, with just different objects and then I'll get into how to do it with just shading. So I have the node editor over here and I'm gonna bring up my, my group over here and just move it off to the side. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab cube one and we have a particle random uh, applied to all three of these cubes, but I'm gonna make it a new, there we go, uh, a new shader, and I'm gonna call this particle emit. I'm gonna change this to an emission shader. And what we're gonna see now is if we render this, um, this middle particle is being used uh, as a, an emiss emissive object and we're lighting up the particles in here. Now, um, if I were to change this back to the regular particle random, obviously nothing's going on. I'm just gonna turn on a color in my background here so we can see what we're doing. We just have the particles themselves um, and they're really not doing anything. So what if I just grab this first random cube so I'm gonna set the middle one to emit again, just to, uh, just to be clear. But what I'm gonna do in my particle system with this selected, I'm actually going to grab the first random cube with just that one shader. So I know we have those three, but we're just using this first one and it just has that particle random shader on it. Now with that selected, what you can do is if you bring in uh, a particle info input in here, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can use to shade um, the index, the age, lifetime, location, size, velocity, um, and angular velocity, but we're actually not gonna focus on this. Um, you can dive into these and see what you can do with some of these. Um, they plug straight into cycles and you can do some interesting things, but what I actually want is to use the object info input. And this is a little trick. Um, because the particle system is instancing these objects, it's still considering them as separate objects within the scene. So that means if I go into this random, what it's gonna do, um, this random value is gonna assign a random uh, grayscale value from black to white between all the different particles. But what I can do with this is actually use this as a mask. So let's say I just have my diffuse and I'm going to add in a mix shader and I'm gonna add in a diffuse shader, uh, sorry, not a diffuse, but an emission, emission shader over here. Plug that in, and then I'm gonna use the random to affect the factor. Now, we're getting sort of weird results because, you know, we if we look at this random, there we go. If we look at this random, then uh, the issue is that we're not really getting a black and white mask. I just wanna pick out a few different ones. And to do that, what we can do is throw in a color ramp, for example, and just set this to constant. And now we basically have control over uh, the amount of particles that we want lighting up within our shader. So that means we could actually throw out these two other particles and just use this one. Um, the reason I like doing it like this is because you can get more control within shading and the less clutter you have to have in your scene of all these different objects, the better. Um, or at least that's the way I prefer working. Now, if you want a different sort of random seed, what you could do is just flip these over, for example, uh, and then you get sort of a different seed and you control them the same way. You could even add multiple colors in if you really wanted to, to get uh, whole kinds of different variations and all that. So with this setup, um, because we're setting this to constant, we're just getting black and white masks. And now if you plug this shader back in, 
Oh, you'll see if I change the diffuse color to red on these. And we're going to plug in our color ramp, obviously. We get a bunch of red cubes, and some of them are actually lighting up. So if I go back in and turn the background off, you'll see exactly that. We have some of our cubes using this emission shader and some of them using our diffuse shader. Now you could go even further if you wanted to. Um, just as a proof of concept, if you add in another mix shader, and let's say we'll add in a glass shader. Um, again, this same random, what we could do is we can just duplicate this color ramp, plug in the random again. There we go and plug that into the mix of the second one. And now we have two separate controls for mixing in two different shaders. So I've got this glass shader, which is maybe a little bit rough, and let's just turn it to blue for a second. And the thing is, because this random seed uh, value is the same in both of these, because we are using the color ramp in the same way, what we're gonna have to do um, is we're actually gonna have to change them over here. So because these are the same, the blue glass isn't showing up because the uh, emissive shader that is being mixed in after we mix these two ones um, is actually overriding it and is using the same seed. So that just goes to show you have to get a little bit creative sometimes with this stuff. Um, I'm gonna take this one out. Let's see if I bring in this one. And there we go. If we change the um, the color ramp over here, then we can see now we have some of the blue glass shader coming in and we have some of the uh, red diffuse shader and then after it all, we're mixing in the emission shader, uh, which will override any of these two. And that way you can instantly get some really, really cool and varied results like this. Um, so that's that for this part. And now we'll move on to uh, some other stuff using particles. So I'm gonna turn off, I'm just gonna turn on the first layer. I'm gonna move this to uh, first layer up here. And I'll have this file uh, available for download for you to have a look at uh, when I'm done with this. And um, if there's anything in there that you're wondering about, then you could pull it apart and uh, mess with the stuff in here. So the next thing I wanna do is I'm just gonna create another plane again. I'm gonna keep this very simple and just uh, try to explain some of these concepts as quickly as possible. So again, I'm gonna add a, um, where are we? I'm gonna add a new particle system. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the gravity, um, just scene wide. That way we just have these particles moving up and they're not going to fall down. They're not obstructed by gravity. We just have them moving up completely. Um, do note that if you turn off the gravity and you have any rigid bodies or cloth simulations or anything that uses sort of um, dynamics or simulations in your scene, this will also affect them. If you want just your particles not to be affected by the gravity, but everything else, then what you can do is go down into the field weights down here and just turn off the gravity, which will have the same effect. Um, generally, if I'm just working with particles, I'll just turn off the gravity scene wide and uh, keep it in the back of my mind in case I um, wanna add something later. So on to the next thing. And let's see, I have a, where are we? I've got my velocity over here. Um, and I did forget to talk about the rotation as well. Um, again, this is very simple. Let's see, let me just go back. No, I don't wanna render this. Let me just go back very quickly because uh, I did forget to mention that. Um, if you turn on the rotation for this particle system, obviously you can add in random rotation or you can add in random rotation like that. So uh, just in case you were using this for trees or something else, obviously uh, if you set a completely random rotation, like grass and all those kind of things, um, they're great to scatter this way. And Blender's particle system is pretty cool because it can handle fairly high resolution meshes inside of it. Um, because uh, the way it instances it is quite memory efficient. Now obviously it'll be some trial and error before you figure out um, exactly how far you can push it, but I've done some pretty impressive things with it. Uh, and I've been very impressed with it overall, uh, as far as it, um, as far as the, uh, I guess the instancing part of it goes. So again, I'm gonna leave this on, um, maybe set this to one and there you go. Now you've got a bunch of random rotations. So sorry about that. Let's head back to what we were doing. So for the second particle system, what I wanna do is I wanna focus on the velocity over here. Let's say I have a velocity of two and they're moving up. 
Now, a very typical thing um, that you want to do is uh, obviously control some of this velocity and maybe give it some randomness to, to make it look a little bit more uh, natural. So I'm going to set this up to three, maybe even five. I'm going to make them go fairly quickly so we can see exactly what we're doing. So now we have all these particles moving up and um, they're all moving up at the same pace. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to sort of affect them and have some of them go a little bit quicker and some of them go a little bit slower. So the first thing you might think uh, is just to go over here and set up the random velocity. But the issue with that is that it will actually send them out in a um, completely random fashion and completely randomize it. But what I want is them moving up um, in sort of the same line, but at the same time, I want them to um, I want them to all stay in the same line. I don't want them to move sideways. I just want them to move up. So this is the only random control we have. And you might be thinking, well, we're kind of stuck now. So we're kind of, um, you know, we're set in a corner. We can't really do that. Well, the cool thing is um, Blender's particle system also supports some other really interesting things such as textures. So to um, control some of this stuff, we can add in a texture. I'm going to add click new here. I'm just going to call this velocity control. And once you've added this over here, um, what you can do is, there we go, go over to the uh, texture tab. And in particle system, you'll now have the velocity control texture. Well, obviously, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a where are we clouds texture. And as we're playing, what we can see is um, we have all these particles starting out in the beginning. There's nothing really there. And over time, uh, they're, they're sort of coming in. Now, the reason for that is we have an influence over here. And if we turn that off, then right now, our, um, all the influences are turned off. So this, um, I guess, this velocity control texture doesn't affect anything in the particle system right now. So once we start messing with some of these parameters, you can do some really interesting things. And um, I'm not going to go over, over all of them because most of them are fairly self-explanatory. But if we go over to the velocity tab over here and turn it on, what you'll see is now we have all these particles that are running at a different velocity and we can control them with this, um, this texture. Sorry about that. Um, and I'm just going to turn on the color ramp here just for a second and increase the um, the contrast of the texture. And this also affects everything that we're doing just to show you exactly what's going on. So all of the black portions of the texture that's being projected on the mesh um, are now standing still. And all of the white portions are now uh, moving up. And that way we're affecting the velocity. So let's say I want all of them to at least move up a little bit. I can set this to like a dark gray. And now we'll have some of them moving slowly and some of them, some of them moving faster. And um, obviously, this texture controls a whole bunch of stuff. So you can do some really, really crazy things once you get into them. Um, but I just wanted to show them as a proof of concept. And uh, as this very typical sort of scenario um, that I see a lot of people struggling with, and I just want to show you how to get it done quickly. So that's another particle system. Um, and we'll move that over to the other layer over here. And I'm not done just yet. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, particle forces. And this is where it gets really interesting and we can do some really, really cool things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a round cube. Um, as some of you know, at this point, one of my favorite objects. So I'm just going to subdivide it a little bit and uh, smooth it out just so we have something to spawn our, particle for, our particles from. Now, the reason I'm using this, and I'm going to scale it down just a touch so we have a very small point where our particles are um, progressing from is to show you a little bit of a workflow with forces. So right now, um, if I play this, nothing's happening because obviously we don't have a particle system set up yet. So I'm going to add another one to this. And I'm just going to play this. And um, because we have our gravity still set up in the scene, we, um, we have the particles just spawning and falling down. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to create something interesting and some really interesting movement with these. And to do that, what we're going to do 
is uh, add some forces to the scene. Now the first thing I'm going to do is go down to the field weights over here and I'm going to turn off the gravity. That way they're just moving outward and we can see exactly how um, our forces are affecting our particles. Actually I'm going to completely turn them off and now we have particles that just spawn over time and that's all they're doing. Um, they're spawning and then they're dying after 50 frames. I'm going to set this to 120 and now they're going to spawn and they're just going to stay on the uh, on the mesh itself. Now we're going to start adding in some forces here and one of my favorite ones uh, is actually the turbulence force. Now again I'm not going to go over all the different forces. Um, I'm going to focus on turbulence because that's one I use quite often and uh, I'm actually going to give it a name over here. Where are we? I'm going to call it FRC, no, turb, and that way we have one turbulence force. Now, to access these, um, these settings, you have to go over to the Dynamics tab, and they'll be over here. Now, what I like to do is actually bring in a second part of my viewport here, just split it, and uh, set up a Properties window with the turbulence forces pinned to it. That way, we can... Uh, have our particle system selected and we can already see what it's doing to them, but we can have a really good representation of our particles and change the amount and mess with the uh, particle systems themselves or particle settings themselves and still have access to the turbulence uh, settings as well. So let's say if I set this to like five, we really go overboard, you'll get some really, really interesting results mess with the size. And this way you can almost um, interactively change all this stuff and see it happening. Now this is great, but I want something else. I want more out of this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this turbulence over. And generally when you're doing uh, a lot of this CG type stuff or VFX type stuff, what you want to do is have multiple turbulences uh, affect the, um, the particles in different ways. It generally makes for more, I guess, natural looking particle system, even though we're working with these really abstract sort of flowing uh, particles, it just adds a little bit of extra detail onto them. So I'm going to hit duplicate and into the Y axis. Now I've got my turbulence one. What I'm going to do over here is I'm going to turn off the pin and with turbulence one now selected, I'm going to repin them. And now I've got access to both my fields and I can see my particles seeing uh, doing exactly what they need to do. Now let's play around with some of this stuff. Um, I'm going to turn the size down here a little bit. And now what you'll see is that the particles themselves, um, I don't know how visible it will be, but if I turn the strength off for a second, now we just have very sort of broad strokes and they're flying around. Um, if I were to turn the smaller strength up here a little bit, you'll see within their movement, there's sort of a little bit more randomness to it as well. Now I generally turn this down a little bit and that way we get some particles uh, with some interesting movement. Now, what can we actually do with these? There's two things. Um, the first thing I'm going to show you is how to actually have these particles be the source to emit other particles from. Um, you can do some really, really cool stuff with this. And uh, it'll allow me to talk a little bit more about some of the other stuff that... Um, can't we move this over? No. Some of the other stuff that we can do with this. So my forces are done. I'm just going to collapse this down again. So now we just have our particle system. Now, how do you set this up? How do you set up particles emitting particles? Because you could just add a particle system to this and it wouldn't do anything. Now, the trick to this is actually using a separate object that we're going to use um, as the, uh, I guess, the object for the particles that are emitting. I'm going to turn these down a little bit because this can get very, very slow very quickly. And you want to test all of this stuff out with um, a little, a few particles first and then ramp them up as you go along. Now, I'm going to create just a simple cube to uh, illustrate the, um, I guess, the point that I'm trying to make here. And what I'm going to do is, you can still see the particle system. I don't know how visible it will be in the recording. Um, it's still going in the background. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to give this a particle instance modifier. Uh, and it is over here. And I'm going to say, select my round cube. And what this does is, what I said before, it's going to grab that cube, that base object we're putting the modifier on. And I'm just scaling it down over here. And it's going to use that uh, as the instance for our particles. And you might be thinking, well, I can do that if I go to my particle system itself. I can just do that down here. 
if I select it, if I can get it selected, I can just do that down here uh, in the render tab. So why wouldn't I do it like that? Well, the thing is, now that we've got that set up, uh, there's a couple of things we need, we need to tweak. For, for example, I'm going to turn on the alive, uh, turn off the alive and unborn and dead, or sorry, I'm just going to turn on the alive. So we only see the particles that are alive. And the thing is, now with this object selected, we can actually add a particle system to this. Now, nothing's going to happen still, it's just emitting particles from the, um, from the original object. And I don't really want to see those. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first turn off the round cube so we just see the particle system itself. And I'm going to turn on Use Modifier Stack. And what you'll see now is that all of these individual cubes start emitting particles. Now, this is where it starts getting really, really interesting. Um, if I were to turn off the uh, gravity for these, then these particles are just going to go all over the place. But what I really want to do is I don't want to have them affected by these two forces, because remember, we still have these two turbulences in here. So I'm going to turn off all. And now what you'll see is we get this sort of random movement depending on uh, the particle system and how it's moving. And I'm going to turn off the geometry movement here as well. So now the particles should stand still and there we go. So what we can do, what can we do with this? Well, I'm going to set this to the end of my um, scene and I'm going to set the lifetime to the uh, maximum as well. So the particles, the, once they're birthed, they're, they stay or stick around long enough so we can see them. And some of you might already be noticing what these are doing. So I turn these up, for example, to 10,000. What we can start doing is we can start creating particle trails. And this, where it gets, this is where it gets super, super cool. So um, I'm not going to get super into this, but I just wanted to show you how to set this up. Um, this is awesome. I mean, we can have particles emitting particles. And if you wanted to, you could add uh, another object into this and do the same thing. Again, add a particle instance for this. And you could have a particle system that emits particles that emits particles. And you could just keep going. Now, I've only used this um, mostly with two systems. I've tried three once or twice. Um, it can get very slow. Uh, I know that two works quite well. Three, three can get a little bit slow. And beyond that, it's I guess it's just the Wild West. But I just wanted to show you that it is very possible to do this stuff. Now, because this is still set to our little cube, um, if I uh, go into the scale here and I just hit Edit to go into tab, uh, well, tab to go into Edit mode, and scale these down, then we can have our sources that emit be a lot smaller and we have the particle trails be a lot smaller. So don't forget that your geometry, the size of your geometry will also affect the trail. And um, this is one of those things that is just really, really cool to do. Particles emitting particles is, uh, is always fun. Now, with that being said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab, where are we? I'm going to grab our round cube which is our original system and I'll rename all of these uh, for you guys so you can have a look at them. Um, after the fact, I'm going to move that, let's see, over to the next layer over here. And I'm going to do one very last thing uh, that I want to talk about, and that is actually tracing particles. But we've already done particle trails, so what do I mean by tracing particles? Well, it will become very clear in just a second. Um, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to add in another round cube, one another small um, sort of point for them to originate from. You, obviously, you can do this from anything if you want it to be uh, from like a um, human form or something like that. You could use that just fine, but I'm just going to focus on a very small point, having them emit from one central point together. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to smooth this out and uh, obviously add a particle system. Now again, we have all these forces and all these things happening in our scene. So what I want to do is I'm going to turn off the gravity again and I'll leave the other forces set up so we have an interesting sort of shape moving along here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the end to 120 and the lifetime to 120 as well. And then once I go back, all my particles will exist uh, as long as my scene. So what do I want to do with this? Well, for this to work, um, I actually want sort of curves uh, that I could use from uh, the particles, um, sort of use their trails for other stuff and do some interesting things with. So 
for this to actually work, um, it's built into Blender's particle system. I know some people like to use the B-trace add-on for this, but um, it's built in and I like using it this way. Um, I don't know, I'm, I like staying within um, sort of whatever it can do here. Um, but again, the B-trace add-on is really powerful and uh, it still works very well. But for me, it's sort of like, you know, if the particle system itself can do it, what's the point? Now for this to actually work, the first thing we're gonna to have to do is just bake. And as long as I don't have uh, any external cache set up, it's just baked to memory. So then we can play it and all of our particles are um, in memory. So we don't have to recalculate them every frame. Now, if we go down here um, and we now set this to path, then you'll see we have the path for all the particles. Now, it doesn't grow outwards uh, as the particles as the particles move. You have control with that from here, but one thing you might notice is that it looks really, really weird. Now, before that, I'm just gonna free the bake and go back and you'll see these trails don't show up. So that's what I, I wanna do, uh, make sure that you understood that you have to bake these first and that's when the paths show up. And it makes sense. I mean, Blender needs to know exactly where these are going before it can draw these lines. And if it still has to calculate stuff, then it's gonna get really messy and uh, that's why you need to bake them first. So as I showed you, you can animate them start to finish. But as I'm animating them here, it just looks weird and it looks terrible. Now that's because we need to set up multiple steps here. And as I'm setting them up, um, this one might be the one that you try to change first, but it doesn't look right. I mean, I can go all the way to like eight steps and yet it doesn't look right. That's because we have to set them up in the display down here. Um, unfortunately, what it's calculating in here is sort of disconnected from what it's displaying. So what we wanna do is make sure we set up our rendered steps to something similar. And now what you can see is we can also see those two forces visualized. So this big trail, all these sort of the length of the trail is our first turbulence, which is slightly larger. And the sort of wobble inside the trail is the second force that I showed you here. Uh, that's making that sort of movement. So just to show you very quickly to come back to that and um, to give you an idea, uh, rather than opening that, if I set the strength to 10 very quickly, then what you'll see is that now it adjusts and it knows that um, this sort of second turbulence is smaller, but it has more, uh, it's affecting it more. So those are things to consider. And this one, uh, this showed you this very quickly, but generally what you'll want to do is free the bake and rebake them uh, if you change stuff. So um, with that done, there we go. Very simple, uh, but we've got our particle paths set up. Now, if we were to render these, I don't know if they'll actually show up. Let me set my background to one here. They're not showing up. Um, now, the reason that I don't know if they show up like this is usually I uh, sort of go towards a different workflow for these. And some of this stuff has been handled in the Blender Motion Graphics course as well. But um, what I'll do here is for this particle system, I'll actually convert it to a mesh. Now, the particle system, as far as I know, is still here. So I'm just gonna turn it off for a second. And now we have this mesh with all these edges in it. and you might think, well, what am I gonna do with a mesh with a bunch of edges in it? I mean, I doubt it even renders, nothing really shows up. Well, if we do a second conversion by hitting Alt-C, we can convert these to curves, and this is where it gets really, really interesting. Now, um, I'm just gonna show this very quickly. What we can do now, if we set our bevel depth, now we have actual geometry we can use, and uh, we could actually control the start and end and have them grow out like this. Now, um, you can do a whole bunch of extra stuff with that, but um, I go into more detail in the, the Blender Motion Graphics course with splitting off parts of the, um, of the meshes and shading them, but I just wanna talk about particle systems for this one. So I'm gonna end it here, um, but I hope this gives you an idea of how powerful Blender's particle system really is once you get into it. Um, it might seem quite limited as first, but at first, but when you look at this type of stuff and look at what we're doing, I mean, you can do some really, really cool stuff with this. Especially, uh, let's see, yeah, I mean, if we extrude this, it might look weird, but you can do some really crazy abstract things with this. And I'm just gonna turn the extrude back off again, but 
This is code to show. Now you've got all these curves you can do some really interesting things with. Um, stuff you could do, for example, if you bounce these around like a head model or, or a car or something like that, you could have this car that sort of grows almost organically inside and then you could have, uh, in post-production, you could have the actual render of the car fade in. And it just goes to show you that once you start digging deeper in some of the, into some of this stuff, you do some really, really cool things. So um, I hope this was an interesting one. And uh, I guess I'll see you for the next one. And thanks for watching.